The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Sayers. Very well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood and Company. All right, higher side chatters, we know that from the printing press to the film reel, mediums of mass communication have always been weaponized and used as the main vehicles for propaganda and culture creation. And along with the school system dead set on churning out obedient servants to the management class, movies and media act as the pacifiers that make many people just content enough with their life of servitude. Well, today's returning guest, Jay Dyer, has been picking apart the titans of Tinseltown for many years on his website, Jay's Analysis, where he methodically breaks down dozens of films to expose the hidden agendas and symbolism they contain. He also writes extensively on philosophy, geopolitics, history, conspiracy, esoterica, and more. And we got him here hot on the heels of his great new book, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. It's a real treat to have him here once again. Jay, my man, welcome back to The Higher Side. Thank you, Greg. Always a pleasure. I'm glad to to be back. We had a really good time last time talking about science fiction and propaganda, and I'm sure this will be equally as exciting. <laughs> yeah, man. I really loved that last episode. I think we also focused a lot on Ian Fleming and the Bond films. Mm -hmm. Interstellar was pretty fresh at that time, too. Exactly. And I also really enjoyed this new book of yours, and maybe a good place to start with that is that one of the first sections is called Film as Ritual, which is provocative. But how closely related do you think film and ritual really are? How are they similar? Well, the idea of ritual could be many things, right? I mean, we generally think of it as a kind of religious ceremony that has some connection to deities or the divine or the celestial. And in modern parlance, I guess we've kind of disconnected the idea of theater and plays and acting from that milieu but it, that's actually where it comes from you know if you go back to ancient greece the idea of sophocles of antigone of the theater was bound up with the idea of the gods and the stories of the gods and you know it's the same with homer odysseus the iliad all of that and so what i tried to do was kind of go back to that ancient perspective and and get a window into that. And I did a, a, a lecture, I think about a year ago, or maybe two years ago, on Plato's Ion, which is a dialogue that not many people are aware of. I-O-N is the name of the dialogue. And it's a conversation that Socrates has with some poets and musicians. And they're saying, hey, Socrates, like, you don't know what truth is man you think it's all this philosophizing and analytical stuff and it's inspiration that's mm -hmm. the true truth and socrates says no you guys are actually just kind of dionysian madmen <laughs> he says you're in, he says you're inspired by these spirits and conceivably you know there is evidence to suggest that in ancient greece they actually were perhaps taking hallucinogens and uh, narcotics and things like this. So it's entirely possible that those in the arts and musicians and so forth, poets were under the influence of drugs and so forth. So mm -hmm. in that regard, Plato and Socrates basically say that it's alternate spirits, alternate gods, alternate other personalities or entities, quote unquote, that are kind of inspiring this performance or this play or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And when we fast forward to probably the most popular modern school or technique of serious acting that, you know, most of the A-listers are into, you get to the Stanislavski method, which is the method acting of Konstantin Stanislavski, who's like a Russian dude from about 100 years ago. And his whole idea was that you could, through his craft, through his methodology, invoke and sort of take on these other personalities. So that's the perspective that I'm kind of coming from and looking at. And what's interesting is that, you know, whether you believe 
that there are actual alternate personalities or spirits or things that people take on or invoke or entities that might invade someone's psyche or conscious mind <laughs> or something like that. Whether you believe in that or not, people do believe in that. And right. so they will operate on that belief system and perhaps under the influence of drugs or rituals or ceremonies or magic or whatever that they're into, they may actually sort of go into this sort of furor, this kind of berserk sort of state, which is what Plato was talking about. So that's what I start with. That's why I start as film as ritual, because acting in the ancient world was ritual. Yeah, man, I love it. Uh, that idea that theater and the practice of acting out those mythological stories is like an attempt to draw down the power of those entities. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's deep stuff, and it's like pretty out there, I think, for a lot of people. But, I mean, it makes sense. And do you think that there is a bit of that drawing down of the spirits going on in modern filmmaking as well? Well, many of the A-listers are openly into method acting. So... Again, I'm not saying that I can prove that they actually do it <laughs> or that they're possessed or anything like that. But what I'm saying is that they believe and act upon the philosophy of Konstantin Stanislavski, which was occultic mm -hmm. in nature. And so he really thought that you could have an alternate persona step in and take over your persona. Right. So that's that's the goal. Now, whether they actually do that is I'm sure debatable, but I mean, how many times have we seen people, for example, like if they have a bad trip, right? And the story is that, you know, in Apocalypse Now, uh, who is it, Martin Sheen, right? I mean, he's supposed to be really tripping when he goes crazy mm -hmm. in that scene, famous scene in Apocalypse Now. So uh, again, this is method acting. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we've talked on the show about the idea of alternate personalities. I mean, this happens a lot in Hollywood and music. I mean, so many actors don't even use their real name, which is kind of strange. I mean, there's no other field like that. And then even within that, you'll have a lot of musicians in particular who have alternate personalities, which seems like a weird thing to do when you're trying to build a specific brand and you've done all this work to build up Beyonce and now you're Sasha Fierce or you've built up Garth Brooks and now you're whatever his alternate persona was that he used. Very weird that they do that at all. And it kind of connects to this idea of being more of a vessel for various personalities or taking on various personas. So I, I think you're onto something. Well, a lot of people think that that's not real. And I will fully admit that in the case of, oh, pop stars and things like that, that it's entirely possible that a lot of it's just marketing, right? So maybe when there's going to be a new Beyonce album or, you know, David Bowie or whoever, they're going to take on a new marketing persona of Ziggy Stardust or mm -hmm. Sasha Fierce or whatever. So it's entirely possible that that is uh, marketing. But I also have read a lot of books from psychiatrists and sociologists and psychologists. Uh, for example, there's a one that's pretty popular called Switching Time. And this is uh, I believe a psychiatrist several years counseling a woman with multiple personalities. Now, that could be fake. I've heard some good argumentation suggesting that the classic story Sybil was fake. But then again, the source calling it fake was NPR. So <laughs> NPR is not the most reliable source. So the idea of splits and alters and all this is very, I guess, controversial and debated. And when you look at the reason why a lot of people dismiss it, the basis is if it's things like, oh, it's not possible because it doesn't fit with the idea of materialistic, reductionistic Darwinism or something like this. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the brain is just matter. And, and we, since we're not seeing anything actually splitting under the microscope or something like this, then it's not possible. Well, that just is assuming that the mind or the psyche or the soul is in itself material, which is an unproven assumption, again, based on a person's belief in materialism. However, if the soul and the psyche exist, then that opens up all kinds of, uh, and it's not strictly material, quote unquote, then that opens up, you know, all kinds of possibilities for what may actually be going on. And I tend to believe that we don't fully know and understand the things of the soul and the psyche. I mean, the Bible even says this. 
in uh, Paul's letters, Paul says, you know, man doesn't even comprehend his own spirit. So how is he going to make these sort of definitive so-called scientistic claims about what's possible in the, the realm of the psyche? So anyway, yeah, I would say that, and I remember like even in college, the first time I encountered this idea, one of my first college classes was a psychology class. And we watched some videos on people with multiple personality disorder or DID. And I think it's it, to all appearances, it appears to be real. I, I don't see how all of these people could be all faking this. Mm -hmm. So I tend to think it's real. Now, how developed that is in terms of you know, can they literally call forth all these different persons through trigger words and keywords? Uh, you know, this is actually the plot of this new M. Night Shyamalan movie, which I thought was actually really good. Yeah, Split. Called Split. And uh, yeah, I went and saw that. I thought it was great. I enjoyed it. I, I tend to think that, I mean, obviously that's a little bit Hollywooded up, but if you read a book like Switching Time, you know, it seems to line up pretty clear with that. And I would say that that would be my suspicion as to what really goes on. But do I know if Brittany has multiple personalities? Hmm. Well, she acts pretty loony sometimes. And if she looks like there's these different personas so i wouldn't be surprised in her case because i have seen some interviews where she does seem to act very goofy and change her personality totally right i've seen people have freak outs on drugs where it's not just them freaking out like it appears to me that somebody else was <laughs> was running that machine right? the, ghost <laughs> in the, the ghost in the machine was uh, switched out there was some other ghost in there yeah I mean, I definitely think there's something to this for sure. Uh, it, again, I agree with you. Like, it's about determining to what degree, but yeah, there's something to it for sure. And uh, I'm curious, do you see film being good vehicles for occult aims outside of invocation? Are there other things in that uh, occult esoteric toolbox that are being manifested through film? Are there good aspects? Sure, sure. I don't think, you know, all the films are nefarious or propaganda you know several chapters in my book are kind of lighthearted and goofy and satirical so they're, they're not really to be taken you know too seriously i think the logan's run and the zardoz chapters are pretty i mean there's some deep dark stuff in in those films but for the most part they're just kind of fun and satirical sci-fi versions of like plato's allegory of the cave and i don't think those are necessarily you know, nefarious. Fair points. But to clarify, and I did say good vehicles, but I don't mean good in a moral sense, but I'm more curious if you see films acting as useful mechanisms for other occult aims besides the invocation aspect we talked about, other things in the magical toolbox. For example, I sometimes hear people suggest that a major aim of mass media in Hollywood is to replace our imagination or to have us outsource our ability to visualize because they know how important the connection between consciousness and matter is and that we can influence our reality, but not if they bombard us with all this filler from a young age. Huh. So I guess I'm really asking if you see other occult related purposes for the Hollywood machine, other than the entity energy drawdown aspect that you had laid out already. Okay. I see what you're saying. I have seen, my buddy John brought this to my attention, John Adams over at Hoaxbusters. He said, if you look at the book, I forget the title of it off the top of my head, but, uh, and I did look it up, uh, Gregory Bateson, who is one of the sort of MK Ultra guys in the background, he wrote a book where he did actually talk about capturing man's imagination. And he saw that the need to control creativity and imagination was very important for social engineering because and in my view this is really the function of disney right it's like mm -hmm. it is all about quote imagination and what they've done with disney is totally weaponize it to capture your children's imagination and really turn it into a lot of dark social engineering things like you know they, they want to take your kid and take her from being hannah montana and turn her into gender fluid disgusting slutty miley cyrus <laughs> so that's that's the real goal of capturing the imagination mm -hmm. 
Yeah, man. Disney is quite a force. And I really do enjoy when people break down Disney films. Sometimes it goes too far, I will admit. And I actually checked out some of the songs on YouTube from that new one, Mona. And I guess The Rock plays a demigod character, I assume from Hawaiian mythology. I think that's what it's all about. And there is a line in one of his songs where he describes making the world. And at one point he says, I killed an eel, buried its guts, sprouted a tree. Now you have coconuts. And I just thought, huh, that's a fairly detailed ritual description right there. Bit of an evolution from when you wish upon a pentagram. And I am being facetious, but I've heard some researchers make a really compelling case that however small, there is a very purposeful occult thread through a lot of those films. <laughs> that's an interesting point. I haven't followed much Disney stuff or kids stuff in general. I, I tend to focus on more. Well, at least in the first book, you know, that I did, it was mainly things that I grew up with, you know, Spielberg movies, Hitchcock movies, James Bond, Kubrick, things that I watched growing up in high school and stuff like that. So, but I'm sure that, yeah, you, you could definitely go a whole other rabbit hole, you know, into kids films and all the uh, programming and, and stuff like that. And, but again, I, I think that the main tool of what they do with the kids films is promote mindless sort of rebellion promote well as you as you mentioned there and sort of the capturing of the imagination and turning it to really just the service of the system i mean yeah. you know disney for for example was for a long time involved in promoting government propaganda and uh, military recruitment that was a big part of what disney himself stood for he had access to and worked at the laurel canyon studios you know, where they did all these secret Air Force films and so forth that I discussed in the book that comes from Dave McGowan's work. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that is a good question. I, I mean, definitely the kids aspect is something that could be explored more. But, I mean, I've seen all kinds of dastardly stuff from Nickelodeon and MTV and, you know, that I think is genuinely intended to have negative effects on your children. I mean, the whole goal of all of it is the depopulation. Yeah, I mean... It could be a stretch, but I've even heard people talking about the sliming of kids on Nickelodeon being, uh, you know, symbolic of semen. I mean, and that might be a stretch, but I'm like, ah, that is kind of kind of creepy, too, when you think about it in that context. But let's get into Spielberg a little bit. You write about him a decent amount in Esoteric Hollywood, mm -hmm. breaking down several of his movies. And if there were a larger semi-organized machine behind Hollywood, Spielberg would have to be involved. So when you look at the totality of his films, do you see an overarching aim or agenda that becomes more clear? Yeah, I think you could boil down to like probably three major themes that Spielberg deals with. He deals with Holocaust. He deals with familial relations and he deals with aliens. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, that's the three things that he he's focused on. So what I focus, well, alien slash transhumanism and so forth. So what I focused on in my book was the alien and transhuman myths and stories that, that he's focused on. And so he interestingly does have a penchant for Philip K. Dick, who I think is very fascinating as a writer and a character mm -hmm. because, you know, Spielberg did Minority Report. So there's a chapter on Minority Report that I do that focuses on dystopia and, and how tech can lead to dystopia. So not everything in Spielberg is bad. I don't think he's totally nefarious or anything like that. And I don't I don't actually go after anybody personally or any of the directors. I just kind of try to decode the films and see what patterns and meanings I can find in the symbolism. So what is Spielberg all about? Well, as I said, aliens and transhumanism. And I think those two things are linked for one, because I personally am not convinced that there's like extra biological entities, but I think that if you watch movies like ET and then you watch something like his version of war of the worlds, the cold calculated scientistic approach that the so-called aliens have sure does seem to match up to the cold, calculated, scientific approach of the deep state and the military-industrial complex and the international corporations. <laughs> yeah. They have that. Because, like, so at the end of Close Encounters, what's it all about? Well, they're, they're stealing, abducting kids and family members, and you get the impression at the very, very end that they're doing some kind of genetic modification on these people. 
and then they're like giving them back to you like 20 years later or something and they haven't aged so the idea is uh, oh the quote alien no overlords are working on genetic modification hybridization gmos halting the aging process you know all these kinds of things that we in the conspiracy world really believe the oligarchs are working on and are into Mm -hmm. so I think that's the real meaning of something like Close Encounters, which actually kicked off the modern alien Hollywood blockbuster phenomena. I can't really think. I mean, there was there probably were alien movies, no, no doubt, many of them prior to Close Encounters. But making aliens into a giant blockbusters, you know, it begins, I would say, with if you don't count 2001, which I tend to believe 2001's about AI, not so-called aliens. But extraterrestrial beings, you get, you know, you get Close Encounters, which is based on J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée, right? This is both of their works were kind of the basis for what was going on in Close Encounters. And actually, I believe Hynek, I found sources saying that J. Allen Hynek was actually consulting Spielberg on the set. Hmm. So, yeah, so I think that you're talking about people from the deep state who know about what the UFO phenomenon really is sort of consulting with Spielberg. Spielberg's putting out his version of it. And, you know, then when you look at E.T., I think E.T. is actually about this idea of E.T. is more like a familiar spirit than he is like an alien. That's why he has this very strange (laughs) bonded connection with Elliot. And, you know, when E.T. gets drunk and burps, Elliot's drunk and belching, right? Yeah, (laughs) this is very, uh... very weird stuff going on there, but. Yeah, man. And this is exactly uh, what I wanted to get into because I, I love that E.T. analysis. And it's it's just so interesting. You talk about in the film E.T., you mentioned the shadow government researcher in the movie is named Keys and that it's a reference to the Key of Solomon. And let's get into this a bit. What is the significance there? Is that message part of the uh, subtly saying that E.T. is a familiar spirit or a demon rather than a space alien? I would say so, because you look at what his so-called powers are, and they, again, they match up much closer to something like a familiar spirit, supposedly, than it does any sort of, quote, alien. It's almost as if Elliot invokes E.T. to come, Hmm. and they they have this, it's almost like E.T. is his higher self or his, you know, sort of holy guardian angel or something. And I think there's a lot of bizarre sort of Crowleyan ish imagery in the film too, with, you know, the moon child and Elliot flying across the moon as a child. <laughs> this yeah. stuff. I think that's suggestive. It's not definitive, but it's suggestive. And so the Peter Coyote character, that's the guy who's playing keys he shows up at the beginning and then he pops up later at the end. And and he's actually this sort of mysterious, almost angelic government figure. Who's turns out to be a good guy because he's opening up all of these scenarios. At least that's how I read it. And actually I think Roger Ebert says something similar to that in his book, the great movies when he looks at ET. So Hmm. anyway, it's a, it's a different take on ET definitely that I have, but, the actual guy, Peter Coyote, interestingly, was a hardcore Marxist, and he was a big time sort of activist, quote unquote, in, in terms of Marxism and cultural revolution. So, you know, I think that's potentially suggest. I'm not saying he is an occultist or anything like that for sure, but it's just interesting that, you know, you don't see this guy in a lot of movies and then he's, you know, Spielberg chooses him for this role. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know why, but. Ultimately, I think what E.T. is was the propagation of a rebranding of the alien mythology for a generation of youth. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was Elliot's age when E.T. came out. So that was targeted at people, my my generation. Mm -hmm. And I think the the goal of that was a rebranding of, quote, aliens, not to be something nefarious or dangerous and some otherworldly threat, but something that we should embrace. And and when you get to my Prometheus chapter, what I argue is that the reason that we're being warmed up to quote aliens for so long and why Hollywood just constantly turns out alien movies like nonstop is not just for blockbuster 
ticket sales. It's actually, I think, to sort of warm us up for the acceptance of a new global religion that melds better with Darwinism. And I think that, as I argue in the H.G. Wells Spielberg chapter in the book, I believe that we've been prepped for this for a long time, going all the way back to the science fiction and predictive programming of H.G. Wells. And that's why Spielberg chooses things like War of the Worlds. Fascinating, man. And I love that E.T. example. I remember when I was a kid, you you even note the fact that E.T. glows as uh, maybe an element of him being more of a familiar. And I remember when I was young, I was like, why does this thing glow? It just doesn't look right. I thought it was awkward, but it makes the point that maybe it isn't, maybe it's a spiritual entity rather than something from space. Yeah. And I think that the planetary connections that we see in the film also suggest planetary deities, right? And this is kind of how the key of Solomon or ancient mythology would have viewed ET and, and the gods, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. I also like the thing that you point out that the government agents arrive in NASA spacesuits in the movie. And that is so weird. Why would you be in a spacesuit anywhere right. but space? But it is. It's in there. Yeah, I've always thought that was odd. And so how do we read this? How do we make sense of this? Well, once we have a broader perspective of things like Kubrick and we realize that Kubrick was working with NASA, which I touch on in the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we've seen the, the work from, let's say, Jay Wiedner on Kubrick and the moon landings and that theory, I think that, and especially given the fact that uh, Spielberg took over Kubrick's script AI, yeah. you know, and changed it to aliens and stuff like this, which I don't think Kubrick was had in the, in the original story. There's some nods and crossovers between Spielberg to Kubrick. And I've always just wondered if that wasn't some kind of nod or or hint that the moon landings and, and Apollo and all this kind of stuff is not what we are told. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we look at other nods and instances in films that I touch on in the book, like diamonds are forever. Well, there's this scene where, you know, James Bond runs onto a movie set where they're filming the moon landing. Yep. <laughs> I love it, man. And you also even note the similarities in titles between ET and that, Kubrick Spielberg collaboration of AI. And you say that it could be a mystagogical code for the origins of advanced artificial technology as channeled from interdimensional alien gods. Great sentence. And I love that idea. I've been hearing it more and more that technology comes from connections to entities like Prometheus bringing us fire. Mm -hmm. Is that your impression of where a lot of technology comes from? Some type of occult workings? I do think that that's possible. And that's I, I believe that not just because of, you know, some kind of weird thesis or something I dreamed up, but actually when you go into the history of, of philosophers or sort of the pioneers of modern technology, you can look at characters like Descartes. You can look at somebody like John D was, of course, interested in alchemy and things like that, too. Yeah. But Leibniz, G.W. Leibniz, the famous continental philosopher who's the co-founder of calculus with Newton. Leibniz was very interested in alchemy and the esoteric and metaphysics and things like this and Platonism. And he is one of the formative figures kind of dreaming up the possibility of a computer or a logic machine. So there's always been in you know, Jewish mysticism, the idea of the golem, which is the creation of a, of a robot being or a synthetic human. And so I think we have nascent in the mythology, a lot of the hints and primeval. I mean, you could almost argue that's kind of predictive programming, like ancient mythology, right, mm -hmm. is almost a kind of primeval predictive programming for what is possible with technology and alchemy. So I know that's kind of, that might be debatable and people might howl at that and think that I'm crazy, but I mean, you, yeah, maybe it was just his own clever insight, but how was Leibniz dreaming up the possibility of a computer, you know, back in the 1500s? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how did, you know, Da Vinci was like sketching out helicopters and stuff, right? I mean, right. Well, where do our ideas come from? We don't really know. We don't know. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's what I was getting at earlier about, you know, the, the psyche and splitting of the psyche and all that is that I hold that out as a very likely thesis, much more likely than the, the Darwinian reductionist thesis, because 
you know, we don't even know what the source of our stream of consciousness thought process is. Right. So how are we going to make these sort of definitive claims about, oh, it's absolutely impossible that there's a spiritual realm or, you know, that we could receive the impressions of ideas or creativity from those kinds of sources. Right. I mean, the idea of the muse goes back as far as artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting, man. And to talk about AI a little bit more, it came out in 2001, probably for specific reasons. But do you see its messages and themes becoming any more poignant in the decade plus since the film was made? Absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of why I chose that one to, to be in the book. I and mean, there was probably 90 to 100 film analyses I had to leave out. Mm. That, that uh, maybe they'll make up, uh, you know, part two or three or something. But that one I, I chose because it fit with the theme that I was looking at from Spielberg, you know, transhumanism and synthetic future and all this kind of stuff, a synthetic dystopia, basically. And so I argued that, that AI is a kind of transhumanist fairy tale that what he's done is taken the Pinocchio myth and reformulated it for modernity. And again, this was taken from Kubrick. This was actually a, a Kubrick screenplay that Spielberg took over and altered. And of course, added in aliens, anything with Spielberg's got to have aliens in there. Mm -hmm. But it functions, I believe, on multiple levels. So it's not just about the possibilities of AI. It's also, in a nefarious sense, if you notice the David character, the AI character, he's always... He's portrayed as this sort of Edenic, innocent. I mean, he is the future of, quote, humanity, but he's humanity 2.0. We make him in our image, right? Mm -hmm. As kind of new gods or new creators. And I'm sure everybody's seen the film, so you're aware of the fact that humanity dies out, right? And the film begins with this sort of eugenics, green Agenda 21 type message of you know, the earth has been flooded from global polar ice caps melting or some nonsense like this. <laughs> and, you know, there's only these, these kind of sparse human communities and the bots are persecuted. And so Spielberg has the bots put into a lot of these Holocaust type scenarios and narratives where they're being, they're being trucked off uh, in carts and, you know, they're taken to the flesh fair, which is this <laughs> Dante's Inferno style torture scenario. Yeah. And so what I'm getting at here is that they're, treated as the new civil rights victims. Now, 20, 30 years ago, nobody would have believed it possible. I would have laughed if you had said, we're entering the phase in the near future where bots and cyborgs and transhumanism and people who get you know, body mod and all this kind of stuff, that's actually going to be a new civil right slash human right <laughs> or cyborg court, right, right. Yeah. Uh, that is now being discussed, right? This is where we're going. That is going to be what we talk about in the next decade, 20 years. There will be, I'm not joking. This is the, sorry, so we went from racial civil rights to gay rights. And then the next quote, civil right is going to be related to transhumanism. And maybe I'm forgetting uh, like bestiality or something right? like <laughs> that's going to be that bestiality and pedophilia that will be uh, discussed as a quote, right. And make no mistake about it. You heard it here on our side chats, transhumanism and cyborg modification will be the next right. Boom. And, and all of that, I think, is being predicted and projected and displayed in AI and also in, you know, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, which is another a chapter in the book. Mm. And there's also quite a bit of Kabbalistic influence in AI too, right? Absolutely. And this whole idea of word magic, and this is something that I did touch on too. Yeah. I forgot to mention themes in Spielberg. You mentioned themes. Well, language and meaning and interpersonal communication is a huge aspect of Spielberg. That's why if you remember in Close Encounters, the, the aliens don't know how to communicate with us. So they have to eventually use sound and, you know, they decode the sound. Do, 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 right? mm -hmm. And that, that becomes the form of language. But the Lacombe character, who's played by Francois Truffaut, the famous French director, is based on Jacques Vallée. And he decodes this message. The way that he decodes is that he hears a bunch of Hindus singing the sort of chant. And if you study how Hindus 
view their chants, they actually view it as a ritual invocation. And so when you hit certain frequencies, they believe, through sound, you're actually harmonizing with the wavelength where those gods reside. So what's weird is that the chant that they're actually putting out is Aya, Aya, Ye, which is very close to the Tetragrammaton or Yahweh, right? Mm. And of course, Spielberg, being Jewish and, and being aware and, and I would say very obviously familiar with Kabbalism, I think that's where he's coming from. That's the, the vantage point he's coming from. And so that, that's where you get to the, the arguments that I make about things like using A period, I period, and then using E period, T period, right? These are done on purpose because letters are symbols and they also have a lot of different meanings in gematria or they can stand for different things in different schools of Kabbalism. Mm -hmm. So where were we? I forgot. Where, where were we talking about? Kabbalism um, or? Kabbalism in, uh, in AI. Oh, oh, in AI. Well, so, so there's word magic in AI when his mom, David's mom, says these magic words that give him consciousness. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that there's a lot of different things you might could read from that. I would tend to stick it in the Kabbalistic narrative of, because this is the idea of the golem, mm -hmm. right? And this is Jewish mysticism, the idea of that you could use different Hebrew sounds and words and symbols to, in a way, be a theurgist or be a creator and cause life, quote unquote, to be. Right. She also touches buttons on his like chakra points too, doesn't she? Yes, that's a great point. She touches the back of his neck, I think, if I recall, mm -hmm. and then says the magic words, and he supposedly is, quote, conscious. So now I don't believe that, that actually we will ever create a conscious being like that. I think that it will always be synthetic. It will always be, in some way, a kind of program. And any Anything that you program is only going to do what it's programmed to do, in my view. So, but I do think that you know, the AI, transhumanism, all this stuff is developing to the extent that people will believe that it's conscious and that it's alive and that that's how they will sell it as a new civil right. And then old humanity, old man will be declared obsolete, you know, as they promote the new man, the bot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I think this is so interesting, especially this idea of sci-fi movies like E.T. and Close Encounters and War of the Worlds, this idea that they have cemented a lot of our thoughts about space and aliens in culture, even more so than real science has. And maybe it is to get us to accept demons as cool via the alien skin. But um, I've also had some guests who are pretty far out there. And in the flat earth territory, and they would say that Hollywood and NASA CGI is where we get our ideas of outer space when really we're stuck in a snow globe. And uh, I don't think you're a flat earther, but if space is largely like it's depicted in films, are there other aspects that are being manipulated? Is it just the alien demon thing? Or do you think there's more to that sliver of the pie? I don't, I don't believe that we really know <laughs> what is out there. I think that there's a lot of different theories and just like with the psyche, you know, people try to have these definitive declarations and pronouncements about what exists and what's possible and what's not possible. Mm -hmm. And they really don't know. And I think that's a big part of the system is giving the impression that they do know a kind of confidence game Yeah. when they don't. Now, I mean, yeah, a lot of things we do know in terms of science, but I believe that real science and, and real advancement in those regions, those areas comes about in things like technology and engineering, mm -hmm. computer science, all that stuff's real. NASA is a PR front under the aegis of the Air Force. So their number one job, that is the, the military, <laughs> is is lying to the public. That's what PSYOPs is. Yeah. So you can't believe any of these declarations from NASA and just look at the fact that NASA, on the one hand, promotes aliens and then turns around and tries to present itself as this totally scientific organization. But it's not. It's, it's a PR front. It's intimately tied with Hollywood. That's why Ridley Scott was talking about how his movie Mars was released in tandem with NASA's supposed Mars discoveries, you know, when, when that last Matt Damon movie came out, whenever that was, like, a few months ago. Right. James Cameron sits on the board of NASA directors. Hmm. Why, why is this Hollywood 
<laughs> director sitting on. I mean, I think that's all suggestive of deception. I don't believe in the flat earth because of the fact that, you know, you can fly from Santiago to Sydney in eight or 10 hours or so, something like that, mm -hmm. which is impossible on that goofy flat earth map. I don't mm -hmm. think that, I mean, the entire military and GPS and logistics would all be off. Everything would be working all fucked up mm -hmm. if the earth were flat. My dad was in the Navy. He sailed around the globe. So I think that's all a bunch of psyops and ridiculous deception in my view. I'm fine with people questioning things. I, I would tend to think that there's a good case to be made for geocentrism. I think you could argue that one. Mm. But no, I don't believe that we live on a pizza crust. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just interesting because if uh, Hollywood's big aim is to kind of control the way we think or to make us feel confident about what's beyond our atmosphere – yeah, I, I just wonder if it's different in any way than what's depicted in the movies. I mean, we might never know. Well, I do believe I do believe that. I do believe it's different than what we're told in movies. Hmm. But I think that Hollywood had its main goal or role in this regard in terms of promoting things like Darwinism. And you say, well, there's not that many movies that promote Darwinism. Actually, all science fiction movies do. Hmm. <laughs> Almost all of them across the board. 2001 a Space Odyssey is a gospel of Darwinism. So I'm very, I'm very critical of that in the book. And I don't approach Darwinism as most people do just from like a list of arguments that they read online or something. I, I approach it as a philosopher. That was my you know grad training was in analytical philosophy. So I philosophically critique Darwinism in the book. And I try to argue that, you know, when you look back to figures like H.G. Wells, who was this committed Masonic socialist, a Marxist committed, why is he the guy who's promoting, you know, the new global revolution through science, through evolution? I mean, these people are committed liars yeah. openly. <laughs> so I think that's suggestive. I mean, nobody, I think you could argue nobody else has had the impact on science fiction and science fiction films by extension to the degree that H.G. Wells has. Right. I'd agree with that. And uh, I don't know if you've seen Stranger Things on Netflix, but... Yes, I did. A, I did a lengthy analysis of it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, what's kind of interesting about that in this context is it invokes all those 80s sci-fi movies like E.T. and it's... Close Encounters, but yet it's very clearly about this being this entity brought through a portal via MK Ultra torture. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, if anybody's interested, they can go to Jay's analysis, and I think there's an audio thing that I did and a pretty popular written piece that I did that, I don't know, I got about twenty or 30,000 views on that, so it did, did really well. It's worth checking out. Oh, yeah. And what I argue is that it's it, it combines Kabbalism and it combines the idea of other dimensions, portals, all that, so it's kind of obvious. But what, what I found fascinating to begin with was that what sparked this in part was a lot of people in Hollywood wanting to play Dungeons and Dragons, believe it or not. Hmm. There was an article that came out in, oh, I don't know, MTV or Den of Geek or one of those pop culture sites that was talking about how The Rock plays D&D. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. So you were talking about The Rock earlier, and uh, I'm not making too much out of that, but you wonder, you know, like we were talking about with actors. Now, I understand that D&D is a game. I, I used to play D&D when I was in high school. I know all about how it works and all that. But isn't it interesting that, as you were saying earlier, with the idea of bringing down the gods or something, like what could, could it also be something where people believe that they are, you know, really tapping into something? Yeah. And that's the, the thesis of, you know, Stranger Things is that they sort of unconsciously tap into this portal this realm through the D, &D game yeah now i don't i'm not approaching this like a fundamentalist and saying that oh if you play D, &D you're gonna like open up the gate to hell <laughs> and anything like that but it does pose that interesting question of can we meddle with and tap into forces that are beyond us that we don't understand yeah man it's interesting so what about let's another movie let's talk about the goonies another spielberg movie seems pretty simple and innocent enough on the surface but there is more when you dig deeper right yeah, I didn't make uh, Goonies didn't make it into the book, but I wrote an analysis of it about a month ago, mm -hmm. and it was just one that I'd always been, you know, intending to get to, and I never really got to it until I was 
reading for spring Mars book. I read it like 10 years ago and kind of forgot about it. And I got that back out and I was looking at that and his chapter on the asters made me think, now, wait a minute. Goonies is about Astoria. Hmm. <laughs> so I read all of Fritz's chapter, which was fairly well sourced and then watched Goonies again. And I, lo and behold, noticed a whole bunch of things I'd never, ever noticed before. The first of which would be that when you look into the actual documented history of John Jacob Astor and the Astor family, all of that stuff is true. He was a high-level Freemason, grandmaster of a New York lodge. I believe he took his occultism seriously. But he was also a high-level drug trader. Hmm. So that's all true. So the stories of him going from the fur trade to the drug trade through, through shipping, that's all true. And, and you can find the public documentation of all that, right? Damn. Which I linked in my, in my article. So that was interesting. So I wasn't sure how to read that in light of Goonies. But then when I rewatched it, you notice that the Goonies are kind of going on this sort of national treasure Nick Cage type journey to – decode the masonic history of their city yeah of astoria and that's what they do and they discover oh actually we're founded by a bunch of scallywag pirates now so how is that relevant well as we know from you know people like jordan maxwell i mean the, the jolly roger flag is the flag of skull and bones because it's the flag of we're not bound by any of your laws mm -hmm. we're transnational so when skull and bones and the oss and these people took over that Jolly Roger symbol, they were saying, we are internationalists. We will run this drug trade outside of your national laws. We're not bound by any of your you know, stupid rules. We are the true elite outsiders. And so what's funny and ironic about Goonies is that the Goonies are going to have their houses all foreclosed on and a, what was it, a country club is going to be built, mm -hmm. golf course, right? And so... They're the outsiders who actually discover the jewels and then, you know, they're able to save the family and all that kind of stuff. So the it's just ironic that they are the alienated outsider youth that identify with the pirates when they decode the big uh, Masonic myth of Astoria, they find the treasure and they're able to, you know, well, pr presumably they're wealthy, I guess, because they, you know, he, he still ends up with jewels, like a bag of them if you remember at the end. So anyway, I, I just, I saw all that weirdness going on. <laughs> that's, that's how I read it. And there's also some weird kind of phallic references in Goonies, which I'm not sure what to make of, but Yikes. you know, yeah. When we think about that in light of what Corey Feldman said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, the, I was something I was going to ask you about later on. It was, um, Pizzagate kind of because child pedophilia in Hollywood has been a theme in uh, conspiracy for a long time. Mm -hmm. Not only claims of passing around child actors, but also having underage kids play prostitutes and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, the political and Hollywood elite are very interrelated. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on uh, the Pizzagate scandal or Hollywood's role in the abuse of children? Uh, yeah, I think I did three or four audios on Pizzagate. So, if anybody wants to like a fuller breakdown, they can check those out. But, sure. but yeah, I mean, I think that it was pretty clear that there was some kind of black market operation going on that dealt with perhaps at least gay prostitutes or something like that. I mean, that's very popular in the DC scene. And that would also you know be connected to things like cocaine and drug use and all that and code words and all that. So I, I, I know that I, I know all the arguments and everything about, you know, what all of the code words mean and all this kind of stuff. But I don't know if there's definitive proof. And, you know, that could have been intentional. They could have put something out that wasn't definitively proven. Right. But what you can prove is, you know, Laura Silsby did get in trouble for going to Haiti and trying to bring a bunch of kids out of Haiti. You can prove that. And yeah. you can prove that she was connected to the Clinton Foundation. You can show that John Podesta made a lot of weird statements and you know what does it mean when they're talking about a hot tub and <laughs> uh, yeah pizza and a hot tub yeah <laughs> so it's hard to say exactly what 
definitively what it is. And, right. you know, was that a plan to psyop the alternative media? I, I don't know. But ultimately, we don't need, quote, Pizzagate to know that this kind of stuff is true because there's like a dozen other cases of the exact same thing. Right. right? So yeah. so I'm not saying by admitting that I don't know exactly what the situation of Pizzagate is that, that it's not true. I'm just saying that. I wouldn't be surprised because there's so many other cases. We've got Savile, you've got the Dutro affair in Belgium, you've got Franklin Coverup, Craig Spence, you know, Johnny Gosh, the White House. <laughs> you know, there's like, and there's a whole slew of other books that you could find about this kind of stuff. The Pedophilia in the Catholic Church, William Kennedy's book, Lucifer's Lodge, uh, Malachi Martin's books have talked about it. I mean, there's just book after book after book that have already dealt with this matter. Right. And I, I agree with you that. You don't need Pizzagate. It's just kind of one example of, mm -hmm. uh, of a theme that seems to be there for sure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you can get a better beat on things by looking at the aftermath. And it wasn't really until that yeah. shooter went into Comet Pizza where I was like, oh, OK. So you put out a lot of smoke that's unprovable. You then right. put do a false flag where a guy goes in with a gun and then you say, OK, we got to crack down on these alternative news sites because conspiracy yeah. is dangerous now. It's not just goofy and wrong. It's actually dangerous to even discuss stuff that doesn't come from CNN, MSNBC. So I totally see that being a possibility for the agenda there. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm just, and I totally agree, like as a thesis, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I could see that thesis. I could also see the thesis that this was a real operation going on, you know, with all the worst stuff imaginable. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I just don't personally know. We, but we, what we do know is that uh, you know there's court cases involving Epstein and his island and all the Clinton trips on you know the, the Epstein pedophile plane yeah. and Little St. James. I mean that that's known. Of course, man. So we've talked about this idea that themes in film can give us an idea of what might be coming even a decade beforehand. Sometimes are there. Any newer film trends you see coming that concern you? Yeah, let's see. I was trying to think of what sci-fi type things I've seen recently that mm, that hinted at that kind of stuff. Because, yeah, like I said, I think when you look back to something like AI or Minority Report, you know, like in Minority Report, you're seeing targeted advertising and you know, retinal scanning, all that kind of stuff that was new to, you know, 2001 or two, all that kind of stuff we're seeing more prevalent now. Right. And so in AI, you see sex bots. This is all in the news now, right? <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're rolling out the sex bots. This was in uh, enemy of the state. It was in, it was an AI. It was in Blade Runner. Some of the replicants are sex bots. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to think of recent sci-fi movies that I've seen that might have new aspects of predictive programming, but, but off the top of my head, actually, I can't right now. Well, there's, you know, the two new Star Wars movies. I guess we already talked about Arrival. I haven't seen all that many sci-fi movies in the past year or two either. Yeah, and I think, as I said, like Arrival and Star Trek, and I mean, these kind of just have the, the more globalist minded propaganda of you know anyone that's opposing the, and i if you can we mentioned rand corporation earlier rand corporation had a direct connection to star trek they were into some of the rand corporation people were involved in brainstorming ideas and based on stuff that was in star trek you can find hmm. you can find papers on that at the rand corporation so i'm not making that up and what's the whole idea of of star trek is what well we've got to have a federation that can rule all of these unruly you know independent existing people groups all right mm -hmm. i mean that's just globalism 101 and, and gene roddenberry would actually talk about that openly he would say you know i'm all for global government we got to have a new world order this is the only way to do things and you know though the way we do this is to get rid of all these people thinking that there's a, a god and that they have their own traditions and that's all just got to be wiped away and we'll have uh you know the holodeck <laughs> <laughs> well there you go so holodeck and vr that's what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was trying to think of other movies. I saw um, X-Men Apocalypse. I thought that was pretty interesting just because the Apocalypse character talks about being something ancient. Like there's a character who asks, who are you? And he's like, Elohim, 
Ra, I've been called many names over many lifetimes. I am born of death. I was there to spark and fan the flame of man's awakening, to spin the wheel of civilization, and when the forest would grow rank and needed clearing for new growth, I was there to set it ablaze. And uh, I think that's a pretty awesome dialogue, but uh, it's also pretty interesting. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have written on Avengers and the Marvel stuff, and X Men is on my list to get to actually. But if you go and read my my takes on Captain America and Avengers and all that, I think there's three or four articles I've done on those. It would be kind of the same themes because you got like if you saw X Men First Class, that was crazy because they're like working with the CIA. They are a CIA project, which is which is just mind blowing. So all that's revealed, and I do think there's truth to this. You know, hope the whole super soldier idea and I have Chris Knowles' book. It's pretty good. So I, I'm glad you referenced him. But I just haven't seen Apocalypse yet. But I I didn't know what to – I was lost, actually, in the last X-Men, the one before that, that where they went back to – back in time and, yeah. like, JFK era. And I'm like, what what is going on here? They're interacting with Nixon and JFK and alternate timelines. And it, it just kind of lost me in the, the confusion. And I didn't think it was that great. But – but there is – you're absolutely right to point out X-Men and Marvel and all that because they're just rife with everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, just, all I can say is just check out my analyses on those movies, the Jay's analysis. Yeah, and there were a lot of bombs when it comes to uh, sci-fi in the last year. There was the remake of – or I mean the sequel of Independence Day. There was that movie that I thought looked interesting, Gods of Egypt, that was apparently terrible. <laughs> Yeah. So the only one I've heard that was good that I haven't seen is The Fifth Wave. I've heard that has some pretty interesting stuff in it because the first four waves are like, first they create, you know, if there's an alien invasion mm-hmm. and there's five waves of it, the first wave is create darkness, then widespread destruction, mm-hmm. then infection, then invasion. And then the fifth wave is actually once the planet is in its weakened state, then you swoop in and just take it. Interesting. Yeah, actually, I did see that movie advertised, but I didn't actually watch it. And the reason for that is that what I'm having to do right now is prep for the TV show that Jay Wiedner and I are going to do. And we're working on the first season. It's going to be 13 or 14 episodes of first Ridley Scott, then David Lynch movies and Spielberg, then Kubrick, then The Matrix and The X-Files, Christopher Nolan movies, James Cameron, Roland Polanski. Bond, Twin Peaks, True Detective, Godfather, Da Vinci Code. And then we're going to do an episode called Gnostic Cinema, which is Snowpiercer, Westworld, and Dark City. So what I'm having to do right now is, and this I just got this information a couple of days ago, so I don't even have the time really to like watch the, the fun movies I'd want to. I have to sit and like, rewatch all of these over and over and kind of plot out what we want to do with each one of these episodes and where we want to take it. So, so that's what I've been working on and our show will be, I think in running in April on Gaia TV. Very cool. That's exciting. Well, right on, man. It's always great to talk to you. Uh, I enjoyed it last time. This has been a blast too. I like a guy who knows his shit and you are one of those guys. Thanks, Greg. You got it. And before we close the books, let the good people know where they can further scratch the Jay Dyer itch if they do want some more. Yeah, you can go to jaysanalysis.com, no apostrophe. And I think I have, there's over a thousand posts there. I've got over six or 700 articles I've written, 120 or 30 movie reviews. And you can find all that information there. I also do a podcast for the last year that's gotten pretty Pretty good traction now. You can find all the free hours. And then if you want to hear the full lectures, talks, interviews, I also do lectures on things like Tragedy and Hope or Plato's Republic. Uh, you can subscribe to Jay's Analysis for four ninety five a month or $60 a year. And if you want the book Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film, you can. there's a PayPal button there. And uh, I do outside the U.S. and inside the U.S. And they are all signed copies. So I've got uh, 25 star ratings on uh, Amazon so far. The book's only been out a month and it hit number one in Amazon's film and Hollywood category. So, boom. (laughs) And it is always best to get the books directly from the author. If you can to cut out that, um, you know, monolithic Amazon middleman, right? 
Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> it does help me out a lot if you if you order it direct from me. And I, I ship those out every day, so it doesn't take that long. Right on. Well, awesome, man. Always a pleasure. I guess that brings us to the end of the show. Take care of yourself out there. All right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. All right, guys. Fun stuff. I really do like the Hollywood breakdown guests because I've grown up being such a media junkie. And even though we all know it's a very persuasive tool, I think there are always new elements to discover. And I really think Jay is one of the best guys focusing on this area. I like Mark Devlin for music and Jay Dyer for movies. And I thought a lot of great stuff was covered today. Probably most memorable for me is that idea of E.T. being about a conjured up spirit entity more than a space alien. It sort of strengthens the narrative of a concerted effort to put certain ideas into the culture about reality outside of our immediate environment and beings beyond it. An effort to depict magic, ritual, and entities and paint it with the brush of science, space, and aliens. It's a curious case to make because you have to ask the why. Why would this be an agenda in Hollywood with cooperation from NASA and military intelligence and also a flooding of the alternative world with a bunch of space alien pushers too, if you think that's a part of it. Some do. It's very strange. Some would say it's because the elite were laying a base because they planned to stage a false flag alien invasion in the future. First you fight nations like the two world wars. Then you fight ideas like terrorism, and then you fight a completely fabricated enemy that you completely control with 100% autonomy. Maybe. People do say that, but I always found it to be a bit far-fetched. Now, if you're a flat earther, you already know why the directors are doing this. Obviously, they're crafting the space concept for the collective consciousness projecting the futile possibility that we can actually rise beyond the dome that encapsulates this island earth a full spectrum deception of the highest order the lie of lies maybe i'm also not a flat earth guy but i will meet you in the middle and say that i love the prison planet concept about as much as the hollow earth and you could fit this stuff in that box or it might be as simple as trying to expose the masses to occult entities and esoteric rituals and their Kabbalistic belief system on the DL. To Trojan horse the masses into the occult. Could be, but the lens of space and aliens does seem suspiciously significant, doesn't it? Maybe we'll never know exactly what motivates that machine, but I think it's pretty clear that those top directors, Spielberg, Kubrick, Cameron, they serve an important function. I can't claim to know what it is fully. And even James seems pretty flexible as to the whys, which is great because it's very arrogant to think we'll ever get it 100%. All we really can do is hold up different pieces, look them over, and see which ones fit better than others, which perspectives and threads weave a tighter tapestry to get us closer to the truth. But we're born into a completely different world, shaped by think tanks, wealthy industrialists, and international banking oligarchs who all have an interesting preoccupation with some occult belief system. Right? Right. Well, fucking A. Jay Dyer, if you like the stuff we talked about in the first hour in the Plus Show, we got into stuff like predictive programming in the Trump presidency, specifically in Back to the Future and Gremlins 2. And, you know, I was unaware that Jay had decided to throw his hat in Trump's ring, and I really don't care or judge him for it. It's just that everyone is so polarized now, listener-wise, that a lot of people are, like, keeping score with the guests, trying to make sure that their team is equally represented. Don't be like that. Some people are scoring me way to the right, and that is not fair because they're given right-wing points for the Pizzagate shows. And that is an elite issue, not a right versus left one. I will not accept those points. And it's going to come up. It's coming up everywhere you look. But I'm spending less time on political topics and more on just the fringe, where we belong. But really, you shouldn't care about either political side, or at least you should be able to separate and appreciate a person's expertise and just sort of recognize their worldview. The lenses they look through. I mean, consider that in what they say. 
and then just see what you can pull out and apply to your own paradigm. It's not really about every little thing or writing someone off completely because they see one of about an infinite number of issues differently than you do, or they take religion more seriously than you do. You know how I am on religion, and I still have guests that hold it dear. If I think there's something I can appreciate about their work otherwise. But anyway, we talked about a lot of great stuff today in the second hour for those oh-so-supportive plus people. G.I. Joe being a conspiratorial smorgasbord, touching on almost all the major themes we hear about in the alternative realm. Military recruitment films, where you might least expect them. Dr. Strangelove as an allusion to the Rand Corporation, esoteric Hollywood film shot on location at Rothschild Mansions, also why the Tavistock Institute would be studying Hitchcock films, the role of 70s and 80s dystopia films like Labyrinth and The Dark Crystal, the films of David Lynch, Jay's thoughts on more recent films like Split and Arrival, and as icing on this crazy cake, we talked about Chuck Palahniuk's work. I never know how to pronounce his name. I just take a shot. And Survivor, by the way, if you did hear the Plus Show, Survivor is his book that involves a hijacked plane. I couldn't believe I couldn't think of it at the time. And we talked about a lot of other good stuff, too. Just sign up for Plus already for only five bucks a month. This show is supported completely by the Plus program. I grew a pair and quit my shitty job managing a GameStop, built the Plus infrastructure, and never looked back. Guys, I try to be respectful of your time, give you a great show, and I offered up for just that five bucks, and I don't bother you with any other stuff. Yes, I make t-shirts based on episodes over at Higher Side Clothing, but whatever. I hope you see the contrast between me and other hosts, the Higher Side and other shows, and recognize even things like the difference in audio quality. I listened to a show the other day from a channel that I have been a fan of or a follower of way before THC was even a thing. One of the most well-known in the alternative realm and the host, she still puts up her interviews on YouTube with the technical difficulties still in it, with terrible echoing throughout the entire show. It's just like, if doing interviews is what you're going to do for a living, take a goddamn second to get the audio right and package it up nice for the people before you put it out there. It's supposed to be your livelihood. So, again, whatever. If you like the show I do, if you think I do a good job, go to the HiresideChatsPlus.com and sign up. It's really easy. You can pay for three, six, or 12-month chunks if you don't like five bucks a month. I have a robust frequently asked questions section on how to get the plus feed into your podcast players of choice if you're worried about that. Blah, 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 right? Well, it does mean a lot to be listener supported and every host is just trying to get your money somehow. But I wait to the end and I, I like to think that I spend less time pitching than any other show and I like the content to speak for itself. So meet me in the middle here. But again, Jay is always a welcomed guest fun and knowledgeable guy to talk to, and I have two more shows due out by the end of the super short month of February, so I'm going to get on it. That is it for me, your move, SoCal Sorcerers of 8mm Magic and Mental Manipulation, your fucking move. Oh no, you see, the world is in Attached to puppet strings Control over everything The nine to five is trying to steal ya Now don't that job seem silly Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back recordings From some spying agency Wish we were younger and free I'll be thankful when it's all exposed the vast conspiracy there's such a difference between us and the damn
cartoons. It's so typical of me to talk about this stuff. I'm sorry, that's good. And well, did you ever hear the argument that nothing really happens? It's no secret. And that the best is plus, it's doubling your time.